Greetings to you all uh, and welcome. My name is Michael Spath and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. I'm a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition and the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions USA. Also the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. We're delighted to be welcoming ICAD USA and the Good Shepherd Collective as co-sponsors of today's webinar. The subject of today's webinar could not be more critical or more timely. The campaign to defund racism is a Palestinian led movement to stop the flow of millions of dollars from US based charities to radical settler organizations in the South Hebron Hills and the old city of Hebron. These monies finance apartheid, Palestinian displacement, racist policies, and all kinds of physical violence against the indigenous uh, Palestinian population. Our guests today are activists and part of the Palestinian resistance in Hebron. Tartil al Junaidi is from Hebron. She's volunteered with several NGOs, empowering Palestinian women and youth. And she has been with Christian peacemaker teams in Hebron since 2019. Uh, in addition to other organizations, Sami Haraini is a, a founder and the coordinator of the grassroots initiative Youth of Sumud that resists illegal Israeli settlements in southern Hebron. And Sami will be joining us shortly. He's dealing with an issue in Hebron right now with uh, some of the settlers uh, who are uh, uh, in Akhtawani and environs. And we're also delighted to have with us our friend Cody O'Rourke, Michigan native, a former human rights observer with Christian peacemaker teams. He's with the Good Shepherd Collective, seeking to dismantle the structures that perpetuate the violence in Palestine and Israel. So Tartil and Cody, welcome to you and we'll say welcome to Sammy when he is able to join us. I'm gonna ask each one of you to talk about your organizations in a little bit. But the first thing I want to do is I want to ask you, Tartil, what can you tell us about what happened uh, just this past Sunday when Israeli occupation forces closed Hebron's Ibrahimi Mosque? It's a place where I take all my groups, right, when we come to Hebron and we visit CPT and, and other places. But these Israeli forces closed the Hebron's uh, Ibrahimi Mosque, prevented Palestinians from praying, forced shopkeepers to close assaulted press crews uh, who were covering the Israeli president lighting a Hanukkah candle in the occupied mosque. Uh, what, what can you add to the story for us? And were, were you involved at all in helping to support the people there? Yeah, so last Sunday, it was, um, it was arranged that uh, for the first time, the Israeli president to light the first candle for Hanukkah and the Ibrahimi mosque. <laughs> and actually not the whole mosque was closed. However, the security measurement, measurement was really, really strong. So um, everyone or anyone who would pass the checkpoint who will get a check, like a DV check, like if a man uh, went to the checkpoint, they would definitely uh, be physically checked. Uh, women, most of women, they have to give their bag to the soldiers and they will be uh, checked. They will get, they will have to empty their pockets, uh, some of them to, um, to take off uh, their, uh, their jackets, uh, their pads to be checked. And we are talking about not only one checkpoint. If you are familiar with the area, there is like around minimum, there is around five checkpoints that people who are living there or has to pass to the old city area or edge to area, they have to pass there to go to their homes or to go to pray in the, um, to the, to the Ibrahimi Mosque. And because there is uh, the Israeli president is coming there and there is a lot of visitors 
uh, the uh, area and Israeli visitors, definitely the security will be uh, strong and will be uh, so tightened uh, against the Palestinians. And we are talking about uh, the restriction for the movement. Um, also, in the meantime, that day, uh, a small demonstration took a place uh, near the Ibrahim Mosque. Um, and like, it's kind of sarcastic that we are, um, that Hanukkah is a holiday about the freedom and freedom from oppression. And at the same time, uh, like a while earlier, the soldiers um, just arrested one Palestinian activist who protested against the Israeli president's visit. And he was brutally uh, beaten there. Um, and um, they were uh, prevented, the Palestinians who protested, they were prevented from protesting there. Also, um, the shopkeepers uh, who are, who like have their shops there since ages, they have to close their shops uh, for the security measurement. However, the president of Israel has no, like he has, <laughs> he will not come through that way. It's just for security measurement. And they force people to close their shops and go home. So, um, so these people were, so the shopkeepers and the others were harassed, even though the president wasn't coming through that way. Exactly. And thank you. Were, were there any injuries? Um, no, there was not any injuries. Good, good, good. Okay. Cody, uh, uh, your, uh, your work with Good Shepherd Collective, uh, I'm going to ask you about the defund racism campaign later, okay? But the work of the Good Shepherd Collective, is, as I see it, is to really uh, make sure that the rest of us around the world uh, uh, know about, I mean, you call the world's attention to these injustices, especially around Hebron, uh, especially in this particular area of the West Bank. Tell us about, tell us about your work outside the defund racism campaign. Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what we do is really quite, you know, is really quite broad in a, in a lot of ways in that, you know, we really kind of like fill in the gaps, I think, of, of what's sometimes of what's happening in the moment. You know, for instance, um, you know, if there are like, um, you know, issues around, you know, villages being, you know, attacked, like sometimes we'll come down there and be a, a presence, we'll, we'll go into protest. Um, there have been other times when, you know, Palestinians have needed like, for us to help raise money to, you know, to get them out of jail. Um, you know, currently we have um, a couple of Palestinian interns that are doing work around nonviolence, nonviolent resistance, and we're able to provide them like some college credits for, for doing that work. So, you know, it's really kind of a, a spectrum of work, but I think what, you know, what we, what we do bring is, is some additional analysis in terms of how the U.S. works in, in different ways in which you know, U.S. folks can can link in because, you know, the way that the U.S. supports, you know, Israel's colonial program, you know, it's it's one thing for Palestinians to go, oh, like I understand how how the Isra the Israeli system works, but it's another thing to ask Palestinians also to understand all of the nuances of how the U.S. system works, and for them to, you know, to develop campaigns that that could be effective there. Thank you for that. I noticed that uh, uh, Sammy, wh where did he go? Uh, I, I noticed that Sammy joined us. Uh, let's see if- uh, It looks like he's yeah, kind of live st streaming. Oh, uh, he's live streaming, the, the... yes, I see it. Do you all see there? Uh, uh, he's live streaming the Israeli military on the streets. Sammy, if you can hear me, do you want to uh, share with us what's happening? Can you do that, please? Yes. Thank you for joining us, Sammy. This is Sammy Haraini from uh, uh, Youth of Samud. Go ahead, Sammy. 
Okay, uh, good evening to everyone. So right now we are in the village of uh, Tuani in the southern hills. Uh, actually, in this moment, there is the occupation uh, army uh, military is raiding the village. Now uh, they are uh, surrounding one uh, activists, uh, activists' uh, vehicle. Uh, they are not explaining anything, but uh, they are just surrounding and checking uh, everywhere near the uh, the houses here. We don't know, but usually this kind of raids they do is for arresting uh, people from uh, the village of Atuani, from my village, uh, or just, uh, I mean, uh, without any reason, just terrorizing the people. Uh, so right now we are really don't know what's uh, going to happen. So, but I will. Uh, and yeah, I would like to participate uh, very quickly in uh, in this uh, in this webinar. So uh, this is uh, what is uh, our uh, daily life as a Palestinian living uh, in Area C and under the Israeli military control. Uh, our uh, really simple basic human rights as a Palestinian is is really daily violated uh, by the Israeli occupation. So when we see like our houses, our villages are uh, uh, more, yeah, and always raided by the soldiers, uh, you know, uh, without, you know, without any, uh, any reasons, you know, it's uh, just on a, a daily a basis, a daily a, a harassment by the uh, Israeli military against uh, Palestinians. Uh, <laughs> beside the, uh, Besides all of this, you know, you are we are talking about safe, you know, living in safe and sleep, staying in your place is not is not possible because our houses as well, uh, right now inside the village is under threat of demolition. Like it's a new strategy where uh, our village have a master plan where we are allowed to build inside, and now the Israeli army and occupation are targeting it, targeting the houses inside the uh, master plan with with the archaeological site. Uh, I want to jump really fastly to uh, to uh, defend defend uh, about the, uh, our work and about uh, our activism in the area. So, like as what's happening right now of the raid of the army or any uh, uh, crime committed by the Israeli soldiers, uh, we are mainly as activists as Yitzhak Samud are documenting these crimes. In addition to that, we are organizing uh, demonstrations on the ground. Uh, uh, this is like simple activities, and one of the main activities we are doing about uh, live, uh, like occupying the caves, uh, especially Sarora, Sarora village, which is uh, about a village of caves. The Palestinians were evicted from there in the end of the 90s because of the Israeli occupation, harassment, and attacks. So uh, we are uh, talking about uh, several uh, activities and uh, others and others from accompanying the school children to school and uh, Sammy, I, I, to, yeah, I, yeah I will ask you about I will ask you about accompanying children in a little bit I was wondering could you I know that you're monitoring this situation now could you share with us uh, about what happened this past Sunday Tartil talked to us about what happened in Hebron at the mosque but this past Sunday the settlers yeah uh, 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 destroyed one of your Youth of Samud projects, the community center in Sorora, water tanks, plumbing, other structures. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that? So uh, regarding to Sorora, Sorora is the village I'm speaking about where we are uh, really recreating and the life in this evicted village by the Israeli uh, settlers and soldiers. Uh, we are having several activities on uh, on the village there. We are there from 2017 until today. Our main goal is to recreate the life in general in, in the village and in the place and to encourage the Palestinians who left from their land to come back to their land and to their villages. This is our goal and our aim. So we are having really from different activities, rehabilitating the caves, planting the land, and so on and so on. Uh, we are, you know, we had a lot of... Uh, uh, troubles since we were uh, starting the idea since 2017 until today and until Sunday when the attack happened. We were, I was personally as well attacked by settlers and uh, others were arrested by the soldiers just for being in the place and trying to protect our land. So what happened on Sunday in the mid after midnight, we left the place going back to Tuani 
We had a long day of working. We are paving the floor outside. We are doing the roof of the cave to bring the water from getting inside. We build the kitchen. We are connecting water pipelines. We have uh, several several uh, staff of developing and implementing the place. But always, always the settlers work is to prevent any Palestinians developing or any Palestinian protection for their land. So, and even, you know, they want to prevent us from access to anything, even the water, even anything. So they just traded and destroyed everything. This is one of the, uh, you know, the like the main activities of the settlers, especially in the last period when the high level of violence by the settlers raised up in, in the South Hebron Hills and also other places in West Bank. You know, uh, thank you for, for that update, Sammy. I know that we were following the destruction of the community center very closely and we're very concerned. Uh, I want to ask you both, uh, 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 Sammy and Tartil, during the tours I lead to Palestine and Israel, uh, we've been to areas that are stressful. You know, we've been to Nabi Sala and Bidilin and Janine and other places, Kanal Amr. We've been there and we've seen the soldiers interacting with people and it's been, it, we have felt danger, but the feel when we come to Hebron, when we, when we come to Hebron, the, the feel that's there, there's always an added anxiety when we walk Shahada Street, Checkpoint 56, the old souk with the fence over top, uh, the CPT apartment. Uh, Sammy, so let me ask Tartillo you first, what makes Hebron that much more dangerous? Uh, tell the folks who are gathered here, what makes Hebron so much more dangerous than other villages in, in the West Bank? Uh, it's not like, it's not about what is more dangerous. It's, it's about what the Israeli forces or the Israeli state is claiming to be, um, claiming to have more security for, for the settlers. So, um, and we can hear that in international media that this is a security for both sides. Um, however, uh, we all know that only these checkpoints are are in the way that that to protect the settlers' compounds only. Um, and what makes Hebron more specific? That is. We can start off um, the the history of Hebron, and um, because mainly uh, the, the 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 main point was the Ibrahimi Mosque massacre. Because um, when in 1994, when uh, Goldstein massacred or murdered uh, 29 Palestinians in the mosque, and since then the whole city uh, structure was totally flat. Um, from the Shahada Street was the main street and active street for Hebronites back then. However, after the Ibrahimi massacre, um, the street was totally closed uh, for like for a year uh, and the whole city, the whole old city was fully closed um, and that was uh, kind of blaming the victim mentality where, um, where because since the Ibrahimi massacre kind of more security happened for the ones who murdered and yeah. that's kind of comes from casting and um, it's weird to have this and it's, and this is all now is supported. Um, like all uh, the, let's say the Hebron Fund uh, organization, this, which is the main uh, funding organization for the settlers, is full of uh, the Jewish community that support this kind of act, uh, of act. So, of course, this of, of having this kind of mentality, they will need more security. And almost uh, we have 
more than 121 uh, checkpoints, flying checkpoints, among them 21 uh, permanent checkpoints, and an average of every one settler, we have two soldiers. And yeah. every settler, they already have their guns and machines. So the, these settlers are not, I mean, they're all, the, all the West Bank settlements are illegal, but these settlers are, are rabid, ideological uh, settlers who really want to displace. I mean, they're, they are there to displace Palestinians. And so that, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for that, Tartil. Sammy, I want to come back to you. Um, can you tell us what's going on there? Uh, and then, uh, and then I'll ask you. Uh, maybe maybe Sammy had to go. I hope he'll be able to come back and join us again. Uh, it looked like he was right in the middle of uh, right in the middle of something that was happening. Um, uh, Cody, uh, maybe you can. I was going to ask uh, I was going to ask Sammy to talk to us a little bit about Atwani and what makes. Uh, uh, because he, he's from there, of course, and most of their work is done in Tawani. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of, more about why, uh, about the South Hebron Hills area and why Atawani is so important? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for the, the that area has, has, has been a target for expansion, you know, for, for quite some time. Um, and so as we see with, the, you know, the escalations, you know, currently there's, um, a campaign uh, being ran by Regabim. Regabim is, is uh, an Israeli uh, NGO. And they're petitioning, um, you know, the Israeli state to push out the, commun the communities of uh, Masafriyata, of, of the South Hebron Hills, um, you know, for, for settlement expansion. Um, currently, there's another little outpost, you know, just right outside of Sammy's door, basically, you know, just a few, a few hundred yards on the next, basically the next cell over, there's another, you know, group of, you know, group of squatters that are, that are squatting there. And so anytime that you are, you know, taking, you know, indigenous lands, you know, that, that mandates you to, to push the native communities, you know, into, into different, into different areas. So um, with that being the case, there's been, an incredible amount of violence over the last eight or nine months, um, not just with, um, you know, people, you know, getting shot and killed. Tartil, you have to remember, remind me, who, who was that, uh, who was that young man that was shot through the neck and paralyzed? Um, what was his name? I don't From, uh, um, I don't, I forget his family name, but his first Abu name. Ha I, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the point being is, is that, you know, you know, Palestinians has, have even been shot out there in the last, you know, eight, nine, eight, nine months. Um, there's been several home demolitions, um, roads have been destroyed, and, you know, currently there's a, you know, there's a court case um, to evict uh, 11 communities, you know, from Masapriyata. So with that being the case, um, you know, the, the human rights activists such as Sami have, have been routinely targeted because they're the ones that are working to, you know, to get this message, you know, out into the world and to advocate against it. You know, as such, you know, sammy has been targeted. Sami has, has been in prison um, and in jail several times um, over the last month or so. His, his brother has also been jailed several times. Uh, his dad been has been taken. Um, so the violence really coincides with, you know, with the settlement expansion that's been happening um, in the South Hebron Hills. But I think what's critical to remember is, is that, um, you know, the Israeli state, you know, can't be seen as like a, a, a homogenous type figure. You know, it's made up of different actors. You know, there's, there's groups inside of the Israeli government that want to see settlement expansion happen. And there are other groups that don't. And so what we see is, is these settler organizations are really the ones that have the resources, have the money, have the political inroads to drive um, Israeli policy to enact this sort of violence 
on the local communities. Thank you for that, Cody. Tartillo, talk to us a little bit about, uh, I mean, I know, I know that there is no day or week that is normal or typical, that you respond to things that arise. But, but what are some of the regular things that CPT years uh, are about in Hebron? Um, uh, you, you, you still uh, monitor the checkpoints? Do you still walk kids to school? I mean, talk to us a little bit about some of the things that CPT is about. Uh, so yeah, I will go to bed tomorrow, uh, our <laughs> right now. Um, so yeah, we're still doing the uh, school uh, monitoring uh, where we monitor two to three checkpoints um, in the, uh, like in the old city border and we call the, uh, the edge to restricted area where there is um, around two to three hundred uh, a child uh, go through these checkpoints in and out. Um, so we want for these checkpoints. Um, what happened in these checkpoints that um, they uh, sometimes, are, unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, Israeli soldiers uh, get out of the checkpoints, um, do uh, provoca provocations, for the children, they might sit outside the checkpoint, um, curse the children, or curse the people who are passing. Um, so that uh, when a couple of children where they will throw stones at, stones at the checkpoint. And when that happens, uh, immediately the Israeli forces will go by all its um, machines uh, and through sun grenades, uh, tear gas, uh, through all around the neighborhood, around the schools, and like fill the place with tear gas. And, um, or if they didn't, they will close the checkpoint entirely uh, in front of passengers, which is the only way for, for residents can go through the go through, through home or can go out to their work because they live in in a prison kind of a prison there. So it, the checkpoints is their only way to go out. And, and so, to, go ahead, please. You were telling me before the call that uh, there are now you now have seven, five full time and two part time. CPTers uh, in Hebron, all Hebronites, and so uh, there are no internationals. Uh, are, do, do you have plans for internationals to come back to Hebron and to be on the staff there? And when do you think that might happen? Um, I think the plan is always there, but actually it depends on uh, on the uh, on the flying and uh, the permits. Because now if you want to visit the West Bank and visit Israel, you have to go to, um, you have to register in a, in a hotel or in a place or a guest house that is either in Jerusalem or in Israel. Uh, and to make sure you are quarantined there. So it's like you only have to have, you are only allowed in if you have, um, an address in Israel. Either way, in another, in another, sorry, in another thing, you wouldn't be allowed in if you are you know, in a, you, you know, uh, um, in the last couple of years, maybe even a little bit longer, you know, we think of Christian peacemaker teams, uh, uh, and they are, right, uh, a part of the nonviolent resistance to the Israeli occupation and to their ethnic cleansing project. We think of them as, you know, walking kids to school, standing at checkpoints, taking notes, making reports, and yet this nonviolent, this Christian movement that that believes in nonviolence, has really been targeted by the Israeli government. Has been targeted by the Israeli military, right? I mean, they've made it much more difficult for people to volunteer for CPT, and they've banned a number of CPT members 
for ten, for the 10 years and well even longer right from from even entering the country so cpt is in the sights of the israeli government that, that that's amazing to me right this nonviolent organization yeah and um like um I was just thinking that information that in 2018, uh, six, uh, six full camp CPTs were banned in Syria to, to Israel and Palestine. Um, so they are not allowed in. Um, so since then, CPT is trying to have a short term intern to come in a tourist visa. And even though people are still getting banned, um, and on the ground, we are still challenging or not allowed being in the area. Um, so now, for example, we are not able to wear our vest uh, in the checkpoint area because we are tar targeted. Um, last, like I think early September, two of my teammates were detained because they they were filming what happening in the school area. Sorry. Um, so yeah, they still are making it hard for us uh, to even be there in the area and film what's happening. Um, and at the same time, they will still accuse us that we are causing the problem. Um, and it's all blaming us for being there and us, like, it's kind of sarcastic that when a soldier uh, told, told me that um, you are the problem, your presence here is the problem. And from getting all his guns and all his machines uh, and that he is facing like 13 years old boy with these guns and machines. Thank you, Tartio. Cody, I want you to say a word. I was going to ask Sammy this, but say a word, please. Uh, he he talked about it briefly, but uh, uh, tell us about uh, the kind of demolition projects that you've witnessed, uh, not only in Atwani, but in Hebron and other places in the West Bank. House demolitions, uh, I mean, we, have, we, we know about Sheikh Jarrah and the Silwan and other places. Uh, Talk to us just about the, the house demolitions that you've witnessed and uh, its impact generally, generationally on families. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that that's what, what, you know, one of the aspects of it, you know, like you say, like the generational impact, you know, a lot of times, you know, people's investment goes into those, into those houses, you know? So, you know, your ability to pass down wealth, you know, from your yourself to your son is oftentimes tied up into property. You know, if you're lower, lower middle class, it's not like your house is your investment. And so, you know, when Palestinians are, are building homes, it's, it's not just about, you know, the bare necessities of, you know, providing, you know, shelter and, you know, a spot to, that, you know, it's also about, you know, setting your family up, you know, for the, for the future. And I think what's, what's really difficult about it is, is to remind people is, is, is that, you know, Palestinians a lot of times, you know, are, are stuck in this, in this catch 22, because on the one hand, you know, you know, people say, well, you know, if Palestinians would just, would just act nonviolently, you know, if they would just resist with nonviolence. So Palestinians go, okay, well, we'll resist nonviolently. And so, you know, part of that tactic is, is to make sure that you're not giving the occupier the material resources to suppress you. So that means like not giving them money, you know, for this to apply for the building permit. By not applying for building permits, you know, you're not only not legitimizing, you know, the Israeli, you know, colonial project, you're not, you're also not giving them the, the, the money to finance your own oppression, okay? So then, so then when Palestinians don't apply for the, the building permits, then the chorus goes, well, if Palestinians would just follow the law, then everything would be fine. You know, so then, then Palestinians go ahead and do try to follow the law and apply for building permits. But then what happens 
is, is that Israel grants building permits less than 3% of the time. You know, so, so Palestinians are, are, are damned if they do and damned if they don't, you know? And then, so that's one level of it. But another level of it is, is, is a lot of times we see, you know, we see the videos of the homes being demolished. And we think that that's, that that's the most, uh, you know, impactful moment of this whole demolition process. But, you know, what's important to remember is that, you know, sometimes these homes get issued a demolition order and that demolition order can last for several years. You know, so you're spending at times, you know, day after day after day for years on end, sitting there in anticipation, waiting for your home to be, to be demolished. You know, I've waited, I sat with Palestinians and they've told me that sometimes they just wake up and wish that the Israelis would come demolish their homes because they can't deal with the anticipation anymore. They want the wait to be over. So think about that. Israel's created a situation, a process in which home demolitions put Palestinians into a mental space where they want their own home to be demolished to relieve the stress that they're under. You know, Cody, uh, th thank you. I mean, that, that's a hard thing to hear, but it's, it's an important word for us to hear. And I'm really glad the way you frame that for us because it needs to have impact upon us. And I'm glad that you talked about the mental space. Your groups, Sammy's group too, and I really hope he's able to join us again. Uh, we're concerned about him, of course, but both of you uh, work with uh, children and youth uh, in, in the work that you do. We just had Lucas uh, Zugby uh, here in Fort Wayne, Indiana um, uh, a while back. I've known Lucas since 1998 uh, and his family, Zugby and Elaine and the, and the family in Bethlehem. Lucas is now at Michigan State University here studying uh, psychological trauma on Palestinian political prisoners and children and youth. And part of his message to us was that, I mean, he was quoting his father, you know, PTSD is not post-traumatic syndrome, right? It's present traumatic. I mean, there's no post about it, right? I mean, and, and, this, and it, it changes the neuron. I mean, it changes the the, 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 the structures of the brain so that this lasts for a lifetime in children's, in children's brains and in their psyches, and it gets passed down generationally. So I'd like for you to talk about this mental space that you referred to, Cody, especially as it impacts children, not just in the present moment watching a home destroyed, but how that gets played itself out over a lifetime, perhaps, and maybe even multi-generationally. Does the question make sense, what, what I'm asking? Uh, because, I mean, it was very, very clear for Lucas that this was an ongoing process, this ongoing trauma on children. So Cody and then Tartil, please. Yeah, I mean, this isn't really like my area of expertise, you know, what I can just say is what I've really gleaned from, you know, my own experience, my own conversations with people and how they talk about, um, you know, their experience of how the occupation, you know, has, has impacted them. And, and, and it really cuts through, you know, the fabric of, of every aspect of life from, you know, from marriage to, you know, your career path to, you know, to the way that you, you know, that you plan your, your future, you know, it's like, you know, it's like even now, like with Sammy, you know, like it's hard to commit to anything because you never know, you know, when the, when the military can show up and that's, you know, that's a critical, you know, thing. So it's like, if you don't know if you can be anywhere at any one given point in time, you know, how do you fully invest? You know, think about that. You know, how do you create goals and long-term strategy if you never know if you're going to be around to execute that? How do you develop long-term programs of resistance if you don't know if Israel is going to come pluck you out of your out of your house at two o'clock in the morning and you go sit seven years in prison? You know, so it, it, it you know, it, it's, 
it doesn't even just impact people on the personal level, but on the societal level. And also it shapes the way that the trajectory of liberation has, has played itself out. I think they said like something like some 75% of the male population in Palestine have been incarcerated. That, that, that rings true to me. I, yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. So, uh, you. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I will, um, I will echo what uh, Tony said. Because when you grow up in a place that you really don't know what is going to happen in the future, and you only see um, land stolen, home demolition, um, almost everyone of us as Palestinians, one of their families was in prison or injured or even murdered by the Israeli forces or have been um, or went through an uh, assault, physical or verbal assault from Israeli forces. So growing up in this condition um, will either get you into two ways two different ways. Um, you either gonna be hopeless or desperate that the future is not holding any good uh, aspect or any, any good uh, thing that is happening that's gonna happen or you gonna choose to, um, to focus on your resistance and fight. However, this is gonna make it, the occupation is making it, even this making it hard on you. Um, Cause now even like little kids, they get into a prison. Um, so you will get into that trauma since really young age. Um, you will get into, into that year since really little age. So it's really hard to what what to expect from this these children who go through this trauma. Thank you, Sarkia. They don't find they, they don't belong to have like a good place in, in life. Thank you for that. Um, I have a few more questions, but Cody, um, you uh, you uh, entered into the chat room for everyone to see that you believe that they're that the Israeli military are uh, 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 um, uh, is it, is raiding Sammy's house right now. Uh, do you want to say anything more about that? Is that all you know, or have you been in touch with him and is he in touch with you and telling you more? Yeah, I mean, he said he can't he can't talk on the phone now, so I don't know if there's any more updates. Someone else is in contact with him. So if I get another update, then I'll then I'll know. All right. Well, as far please, as I know uh, right now, please let me know, and so that you can share uh, with the uh, with the whole group, because of course we're very concerned for him and his family, and you know we want to we want to know. Okay. So yeah, keep us mm -hmm. posted. Thank you, Tartil. I, I I'd like for you to share. Uh, uh, 2021 is CPT's 35th per, uh, anniversary. Uh, and so that's uh, a wonderful milestone for CPT. Tell us uh, about your initiative from last year through their lens. Uh, um, uh, a platform for kids to talk about uh, their lives through photography. Can you say more about that for us, please? I, th I think you'll have to unmute her oh, first. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Somehow yeah. she got muted. Um, sorry about Thank that. Um, so yeah, Through Their Lens uh, actually started um, in the mid of 2020, um, where we targeted uh, five children um, to express about their life and mainly feelings through photos and small captions. Um, our targeted group was children from age 13 to 17. We choose that age because we feel that this age where we start to grow up and where the adult, 
people will uh, start to suppress our feelings and start to normalize things. Um, so we feel like this is the age where we will give the space for these children to talk about themselves and express about their feelings, their hopes, their dreams, a way of um, all the, the adult um, uh, expectations from them. Um, so we ask these children to suggest for us a couple of subjects that they feel would love to talk about. So um, we ask them to take a photo that will express something from their personal lives and say something about it. And somehow when we choose um, a totally unrelated subject to the occupation, we, uh, we ended, up, ended up with a story related to the occupation. And that I will like, I will connect that with your last question about the trauma. So it's something ongoing and it will keep getting to you. You, you don't have a choice about that because you are, you are already living that. You don't have to choose it. Um, so we are now, we finished with two groups um, with mainly, they were, they were pairs. Um, we talked about a lot of subjects and this is really exciting project and really close to my heart because um, you will allow these kids to be friends with you and to feel really this safe space to express their feelings. Um, now we are uh, trying to find uh, another group of male children um, and to start the project with them. Uh, this is gonna be really challenging because there is a lot of cultural um, uh, obstacles and also like uh, the occupation also target male children. So there is a lot of things that, a lot of trauma we are talking about in mainly male Palestinian children. Um, so we don't know how this will go. Um, but yeah. Thank you for that, Tartil. Tell us if, if, we're, if we were interested in, in seeing some of these photographs or learning more about uh, Through Their Lens, where would we find that? Um, you would find these in uh, mostly our social media. And if you signed up to our mailing list, you will receive that kind of like every month. Um, and we are, the CBT is working on developing uh, the new website. Uh, so you will find that in a specific category, but maybe not now in like a couple of months from now. Thank you very much. I know that many of us on, on the call would be interested in, in this project. Thank you. Uh, you, you know, Christian Peacemaker Teams, Youth of Samud, Good Shepherd Collective, each one of your organizations have adopted nonviolence, not, not simply as a strategy, but as a way of life. It's an, it's an integral part of your of your existence, of, of your very being. I mean, there, there are many different ways to resist the oppression. And God knows you, you wouldn't be blamed if you chose uh, um, a, a more, what, uh, uh, a more active, a more uh, violent approach, right? Of taking up arms or, or whatever. And yet your three organizations and many, many, many other Palestinian organizations have chosen a nonviolent approach. Uh, what is it about that approach uh, uh, for you, Tartil, uh, that has drawn you to be a member of CPT and uh, uh, your your uh, um, associates in CPT? Um, for me personally, I would say there is a code that I like. I'm not sure if it's from the Bible but it said that be the voice of the voiceless. Um, and 
somehow me as Palestinians, I was not always, I, I not always had the chance to be, to speak up for myself at the, at the first place. Let's start from there. Um, but being in CBT, this gives you a choice and this will give you the space and the platform to, to resist and to speak up for justice um, in a nonviolence way. And not, not everyone has that choice. And I, like, with, with CBT, I have it. I had it. So me believing in justice and believing that um, all kinds of oppression in the world will end at this at some point. And like many last vast experience from history prove that. And I believe I personally believe in that. I believe that the Israeli oppression will end and Palestine will be free. So I had the choice, I had the option to to be with that kind of work. And and there is a lot of um, um, a lot of talk about um, the nonviolence, and especially in the Palestinian community, because when we talk about nonviolence, and some of us, some of us as Palestinians, will talk about peace deals, and their minds will go to peace deals and uh, to normalizations. And the thing that I love about CBT and many other organizations that it's a Palestinian-led nonviolence organization, and they will give the voice for the Palestinians. And they will start from there. Thank you for that, Tartil. Um, tell me, uh, um, what is it? There's, there's a real, there's a real uh, 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 strong connection of Palestinians with the land. It, it's, it's a cause for mourning in the community when a Palestinian family or an individual emigrates to the West, for example, or goes, leaves, leaves the community, leaves the country. I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the commitment to stay requires so much courage in the face of so much oppression. Talk to us about what you've noticed. I mean, you yourself, a Hebronite, uh, you're staying, you're working uh, in the cause of justice. What is it within the, the Palestinian heart and spirit that, uh, that, that is so strong and keeps you connected to the land and keeps you there, keeps you it's, there? It's part of our, our culture and the way that, uh, that we grow up. Like, you already be born in this situation. Um, and like I, like, I remember, for example, my dad will always tell me uh, a story about when he was um, allowed to visit Yaffa or Gaza or Haifa and go through transportation and go through um, uh, the train. So we all, like all Palestinians, have this verbal and uh, verbal and spoken memories uh, from our grandparents and from our fathers about the land itself. Like the land, it's kind of even with our culture, is connected with with dignity. If you are like, if you have, you, if you keep up with your land, if, and if you if you don't lose your land, just you have your own dignity. And and even from like like really long period, having the land is way more important than having. Uh, goal than, than having many other things like having the land and uh, being there uh, it's really one of the main things for Palestinians mentality. Thank you Tartil. Cody I'm glad you're back. Uh, welcome back. 
Um, before we go any further, uh, we're, we're about to wrap up. So Cody, I'm glad you're back. We have a, we have a number of questions, but I want to give you a chance to talk about the defund racism campaign and uh, tell us why you've chosen the word racism as opposed to simply occupation or oppression. I mean, this is a racist. Uh, th these are racist projects. So talk about that and then tell us about the campaign and how we can take part. Yeah, well, I mean, the, I, I think what's critical this is, is that, you know, when we're talking, right, so, so talk about the campaign. What we see is, is, is that these settler organizations, they're really the ones that are shaping Israeli policy. Um, you know, these are the organizations that push forward the nation state bill, remember? The ones that, that marginalized even being um, a Palestinian and regulated them to a second class citizen. Um, these are the organizations that, that changed the process of home demolitions. You know, previously Palestinians had like 30 days to file an injunction against a demolition order. The organizations that are changing all nations are financed in part by charitable donations from the United States, meaning that nonprofits in the United States are collecting money and giving it to these organizations. Okay. So when we do our analysis and we think of, of, you know, how can we change the way that Palestinians are experiencing structural violence? And what we mean by that is the violence of the laws and policies that are enacted by resources of those individuals, and those group laws and policies. So the way that we look at that is going, so for U.S. citizens, how can they curb the money? Well, they can curb the money by challenging the nonprofits in the United States that funnel that sort of money. Now, um, when we did our analysis of this campaign, what we found was is that people have made this call to challenge these nonprofits that are, that are financing the settler movement. But in previous campaigns, those complaints were filed with the IRS, okay? What's critical to note is, is that because the United States is a federal system, you're dealing with state tax law and federal tax law. So individual states also have the power to, to decide if these charities have, are eligible to, to remain tax exempt. Okay, so in our case, we decided to target the New York Attorney General because they have the power, like the IRS, to make a determination on how these charities can funnel money. Now, what's <laughs> critical is, is that the, the Attorney General, unlike the IRS, for with them being elected official, a grassroots movement to mobilize their constituency then becomes a tool that, that people can deploy. So the reason, so so the reason why we call it defund racism is, is that these US charities are not only funding the dispossession of Palestinians, but they're all they're also financing all kinds of alt-right movements. For example, Fidelity Charitable, the largest charitable organization in the United States, $700,000 ran through that to cover transportation costs for the January 6th insurrection. What's like other initiatives that are going on, like currently there's a whole process going across the district. All of those political initiatives are also being financed through these different U.S. charities, you know, police foundations. You know, that are funding the, the violence against black and brown communities. They also enjoy 
tax exempt status. So or I can get Leticia James to make um, US charitable law is administered, then that impacts all of these other sorts of organizations that are financing racist projects, not simply in Palestine, but also in the United States. So Cody, uh, uh, I think we caught most of that. You were kind of uh, blipping in and out, but I, th I think we got uh, most of what you had to say and it was really very, very helpful for us to hear this. How can we participate in the defund racism campaign? Well, the most critical thing is for most folks is, is to get on the website, which I put in the chat. So open up your chat. The website goes to defundracism.org. At the very top of the page, there's a place for you to sign the petition to send that to Leticia James. So open up the website, sign the petition, and then, you know, that starts the ball rolling for you to get updates, um, other information that you can share through your networks. If you also belong to an organization, you can get your organization to endorse the campaign. You can take another step and also sign up to, to hold a webinar. And there's, there's additional layers in which you can become involved depending on how much time and resources you have. But at a very bare minimum, we're asking people to please get on the website, sign the petition. Thank you, Cody. Uh, I'm gonna give, uh, um... I'm going to give Cody and Tartiel a chance to, for just their closing thoughts in just a second. We want, please, uh, Cody, I know that you and uh, a couple of other folks are in touch now with Sammy. Um, please send him our best. Uh, uh, and we hope that uh, uh, we hope that he uh, is OK and his family as well. Uh, but um, Tartil, what would be your closing thoughts that you'd like to share with us today? Um, maybe I was just um, talking about, like, since we are talking about defund racism, so, and why, why as, like, CBT has endorsed with that campaign, and, like, let's talk about what is these organizations are really doing in the old city in Hebron? And we are mainly talking about Hebron Fund. So Hebron Fund actually um, directly fund uh, the settler tour. And if you are familiar with the settler tour, there is a lot of um, settlers violence happening uh, in the old city, destroying shopkeepers, uh, property um, and sometimes physical assault. Um, that's one. On the other, on another level, they directly fund uh, the, to have a security uh, for the settlers by providing many uh, things to ease the soldiers' lives in the old city and in these checkpoints. Also, um, I would like, they also like fund, <coughs> sorry, they also fund um, all the settlers activity that is happening in the Jewish holidays. And we all know, like, um, we always have this fear and anxiety because we know um, the Hebron Fund is the access for many settlers and many Israeli visitors to come to Hebron and um, and sponsor all these activities that will directly um, affect the Palestinians who are living there and like physically assaulting them, hurting them, destroying their property and uh, like many, many settlers violation happening in the Jewish holiday that are directly funded by the Hebron Fund. Thank you so much, Tartil. And Cody, your closing thoughts for us today. Yeah, I think that, you know, when you go to the website, you can look and see that, you know, over 200, you know, Palestinian villages, um, community activists, um, the entire Palestinian NGO network have all signed on to endorse this campaign and push this forward. Um, you know, so this, this call isn't just from 
um, the Good Shepherd Collective, the Christian Peacemaker teams, or the Youth of Samud. It's really coming from, you know, a broad section of Palestinian society, and not just Palestinian society inside of the West Bank, but Palestinians in East Jerusalem, but also in the Nekka. Um, you know, because those Bedouin communities down there have also been the target of Regabim and other far right um, organizations. Um, it, it's really critical to understand how these Palestinian or how these Israeli um, NGOs are able to manipulate the charitable structures in the United States to impact um, Palestinian liberation in, in very real rate ways. For example, just this last week, six or just this last month, six Palestinian um, NGOs were designated as terrorist organizations. It was the Israeli NGO called the NGO Monitor were the ones that pressured Benny Gantz into making this sort of designation. So it's critical that we connect the dots from um, Israeli policy formation, Israeli NGOs, and how the US 501c3 system fuels that. So, Palestinians are asking you to please join this campaign because we feel as though that it's it's both can make a very real impact on the ground here, but it's also a winnable campaign. Which is very which is very important. And Cody, you uh, uh, and the Good Shepherd Collective are in the forefront of helping us connect those dots, and so we appreciate it. we appreciate you and we appreciate Tartil and that kind of uh, well, on the ground courage uh, and witness that motivates us and inspires us uh, for our solidarity. So I wanna just say to all of you, and please again, pass along our regards to Sammy and his family, and we hope that they're well. So everyone on behalf of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, ICAD USA, the Good Shepherd Collective, Christian Peacemaker Teams, and the Youth of Samud. Thank you very much for joining us today.